Um, hi, my name's Andy Parter. I'm going to tell you a little bit shortly about myself and my, my history so you know the context of what I'm talking about. Um, and really, although Advertise here is um, des robust design implementation at Rolls-Royce Aerospace, that, that's really what I mean by that title there. That's what I'm going to talk about. But specifically speaking, at Rolls-Royce in Bristol, uh, we also have Rolls-Royce um, facilities in Derby and in Dalewitz in Germany and in Indianapolis in, in the States. So let's get this technology working. Okay, so a quick um, run through what we're going to talk about for the next 20 odd minutes. Um, quick intro to me, uh, I'll talk about the complexity of our organisation and the complexity of our products and, and why that makes um, some of the idealistic views on robust design a bit more difficult to implement. And so, and then going into the challenges specifically on robust design and what we discovered through trial and error and, and lots of failure and some success, what, what the key <laughs> enablers were. And then a very brief summary on, on, on what we think, out of the whole process, uh, painful and, and joyous in, in mixed bags of both, um, what was really the good stuff out of all of it. Okay, so I thought I'd start with something more fun. My wife bought this toaster. <laughs> And I thought as a, a little um, pop quiz, what do you think the requirement was wrong on that toaster? That toast is toast, by the way, not bread. <laughs> Just to give you a clue. <laughs> My wife bought it because it looked like the kettle. <laughs> but but their, um, the, the function was right. They got the functional requirement right to heat the toast. Okay, so they got that, heat the bread rather, turn it into toast. But they didn't get the um, constraints on that, right, to heat bread of normal length that you buy in a supermarket, I said to my wife. No, we want this tiny little wholemeal stuff only. Okay, so it's just well, one of the things about working with robust design is you start to see it out there day to day, day in, day out, and you start to feel it. It really makes a difference to how you work. So, uh, so this, this is me. I started, um, I graduated uh, in 94, and as parallel to that, I was a trainee with Rolls-Royce. So, um, lucky really, because I've managed to, through that parallel uh, studying and, and working, I've managed to just get to my 25-year uh, award and a free pen. <laughs> so, uh, so <laughs> well, no, a pen, 25 years, it takes a long time to earn a pen. <laughs> and um, so, I, I, I've worked in design mainly, I won't go into great detail, but mainly I've been in design, but I've poked into stress, I've poked into functional performance, um, I run an IPT designing a, a big swiveling nozzle on Joint Strike Fighter. I've done some um, component work on seals. And then I spent, I told them at that point, you're training us all in robust design and, and really um, we're not doing it very well. So you want to you give me a job as a robust design specialist. And they fell for it, which is great because I loved it. And, uh, and then I had five, six years of uh, being a robust design specialist. Just this year, uh, my boss said, I think we're up the curve. I don't think you need to be full-time. Go and be a specialist in the project. And thankfully, and really exciting, I'm working in the future programs looking at new engine concepts at the moment. Okay, so that's just me. Um, chartered engineer, member of IMIC. So th this is a little bit about gas turbine engines. Uh, these are, by the way, some engines from our um, colleagues in Indianapolis, Rolls-Royce, uh, a 2100s, I think, on the uh, on the Osprey engine on the Osprey aircraft. There, um, so typically 4,000-ish part numbers, unique part numbers per engine. Blade stresses. We used to say blade stress is equivalent to a, an elephant hanging off a blade. But if you don't know what a blade's like, imagine the iPad swinging around off a, a human hair. It's quite high. <laughs> yeah. And uh, gas temperatures hotter than the material melting points, so we need to be fiendish about cooling the, the hot stuff with cooling air. Um, 9G manoeuvres and supersonic flight in, in some of our combat engines. We have also have long-term service agreements, so I'm talking about the product attributes there, but we, are, we also have products that we sell, half of our revenues from service. So long-term service agreements are also products that bring in half of the profit that we make. Um, some of our product families out there are up to 50 years in service. The Pegasus is uh, about 1960s odd, so it's just got past its 50th birthday. And it's still out there flying in the Marine Corps, in India, Spain. 
And, uh, and those 50 years mean that that product is designed at the beginning, a long, long time ago, and then it has many, many variants and many modifications as it goes along. And all those variants and modifications are ultra-constrained by certification of flight safety. So a lot of our work is in production, very constrained work. This is a, a kind of view on the, that's the product, this is the organisation, this is a headache we have in trying to bring robust design into um, these products. So designing a gas turbine engine, it's, it's not just drawing something, it's doing all the functional design as well. So we've got geometry definition, stress, fluid dynamics, aerodynamics, blah, 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 all that different coloured stuff there. No one is good enough to do that all in their head, okay? So you need to integrate lots of different functional capabilities to make that design successful. Um, we also have a matrix structure, business, customer aligned organisation. So we've got the functional experts, we've got the customer aligned experts. And uh, we've got to deal with having two directions of management, which is fun. And... Um, and then we've got a complex group of external stakeholders. Uh, so we've got the governments in, in military mainly, airlines and civil, air framers and pilots, and air framers again, I don't know why they're there twice, maintenance crews, airworthiness authorities, so on and so forth. So um, we talked about systems engineering, and I thought I'd just bring this one out. The, the British people, or, or the, the Anglophiles around here, will recognise this uh, picture from the 80s. This was when I was about 10, I think. And um, does anyone recognise what that is? The Sinclair C5? So it's a Clive Sinclair, an archetypal British buffing inventor. You know, what British are best at? Inventing stuff and then not making any money out of it. <laughs> exactly what they did here. <laughs> so uh, really innovative design here. Um, but we never saw them on the street. Didn't sell any. You know, you saw occasionally on Tomorrow's World or a telly or the news or something. But you just didn't see them driving around. So, so has anyone got any idea what the forgotten requirements are? What, what did they get wrong that meant people didn't want to buy it? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's definitely it. So um, not much good on rainy days. Not much good when you've got a 20-ton Arctic sitting behind you. you know? so, um, so everyone just looked at it and said, not on your Nelly, I'm not going on the road on that thing. And uh, he didn't sell any. And, and that's the thing, you see. So, so we can be robust in designing our products. But unless we really understand what our products need to do, we're not making it robust against the right things. And that's why I always say systems engineering, robust design, in the same sentence. It's the same set of design techniques and tools. Systems engineering sets you up with the right requirements to be robust against. Then you go and make sure you're robust against them and really um, dig into it properly. So th this is some going into more of the workplace culture questions, really. Some of the challenges to applying robust design that we've discovered in Rolls-Royce. So, so going back, so here's some data. Back in 2009, we would trained 70% of our designers on a week-long course in robust design. It's a really positive amount of investment into robust design that we've made. So, so that's the big plus, you know, the, the, the corporate leaders had said, we'll spend all this money. You know, that's, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred people all trained up for a week-long course. So it's, it's a lot of investment. But, but I went around and surveyed them, and only half of them had actually ever applied any of it to their work. And they'd all been trained over the past three years, so they had plenty of opportunity. I thought, oh, crikey. So when, when I asked them, you know, what, what's the causes of you not using it? I'm not, I'm not going to get you fired. I won't give, give your name to the boss that you haven't done it. Um, so they gave me some candid answers, and, and sort of summarised, it came out a, a bit like this. So, so they've always got time pressure from the customer and the internal customer. They've got to deliver... Um, there's always pressure on budget, so that when they go away and say, well, we'd really like to, to do a, a big, expansive DOE on this, they go, no, <laughs> you're not having an extra 200 hours to do a big, expansive DOE on this. Um, they found robust design was being applied, I found robust design was being applied preferentially. We started off our robust design journey by calling it Design for Process Excellence. Um, as the counterpart to a process excellence program, which was in itself a kind of mirror of GE Six Sigma program. Um, and we found that we'd, be, we'd been doing projects in robust design. We'd been picking difficult problems and applying robust design to those difficult problems. And that had turned it into a niche tool, like a special set of tools in the cupboard that you only opened up when you were really worried. And actually, it also meant that the robust design application 
was much more likely to fail, in that you were much more likely to not solve a really difficult problem. That's just life. <coughs> so that was definitely wrong. <laughs> you know, these are tools and techniques that apply to anything and everything. Um, and then there was also a growing risk that overuse of some of the tools was giving our leaders uh, an impression that we were getting lost in science projects. And that's a term that they, they directly use when they're talking about robust design, when they're not one yet. So um, I had to win. I had to beat that. So here's some, um, without going into the history too much of, of how we got there, here's some uh, statements on, on things that we found actually did work. Um, so first, we found that um, getting some data on the benefit of doing robust design persuaded our senior leadership that doing robust design was actually a, a, a in the job cost saver and not a cost adder. There was a perception that this science project perception, the perception that it's going to cost you more overall. And um, we went and interviewed our, our um, there's some data that you can uh, examine in the website after. But if I can summarize it briefly, we interviewed our engineers and we asked them in confidence again so that we, they weren't feeling any blame. They were giving us very honest answers. D did you find that applying these robust design and systems engineering tools and techniques helped or hindered or, or added or took away time from your task? And a lot of the we were really expecting them to say, but we started with this half of the graph. We said, did it add a little bit of extra time or did it add a lot of extra time? That's all we said. We, d we, know we said more than 20% was up there and less than 20% was down there. So they didn't have to be too precise. We just wanted a, a map. And they said, and across here, we said, how much benefit did you get from it? But what was the insight you got from using those tools and techniques? So, so we got some results that were kind of up here. A total waste of time, cost me some time. So, so that wasn't a win. But actually, we got an awful lot of stuff over here. And they started telling us about this half of the graph that we hadn't imagined before we started asking them. And they were saying, you know, actually, it didn't add any time because going through, especially some of the matrix methods and some of the DOE methods, they would say, going through that told me something about the design that made, made me change my mind and, and early in the process start doing what I was doing again. And if I hadn't done that, which was the other question, then... I would have been, you know, I would have been getting close to the production stage and I'd have been starting again. I'd have been tearing it up and discovering very late in the programme that I'd made a mistake. So that early discovery was pushing them into, into telling me, and that I fed this back to the leadership, that actually we were um, reducing the effort overall by discovering problems early, by really robustly looking at the problem, by exploring the, uh, the, uh, the system and its interfaces, by exploring the response of the system with uh, tools like DOE. The other thing that really made a difference was to take the people that um, technically authorise uh, the, the work and stick them on the training course that the engineers go on so that they really understand the point of robust design and, and what it delivers and they really understand the tools and techniques that these guys are talking about. And not only that, the other thing that they understand is really the value you get from the tools and techniques so that they can help the engineers filter out the right tools and techniques in the right situations. Um, and then the top bullet, really, that was just employing me. But we got a measure of it. We'd, we'd been tracking. <laughs> we'd been tracking um, requests. So, so I'd been uh, an amateur, you know, part-time, helping people with, with the idea of robust design. Um, and then this is just measuring the amount of requests I was getting and support I was giving. Then I said, no, make me full-time. And that tripled the rate of, of activity in robust design. And then we stuck our chief design engineers on the training course. They all went away and came back a week later, a small lag. And then suddenly, I was overwhelmed. You know? <laughs> I was totally swamped. The, the rate tripled again. It was a huge rate increase. And it was just a total culture change in the project office. The chief designers, the, the customers, were demanding that we applied robust design. And it was that pull that made a huge difference, and that pull that's really started to change our culture in the office. The other thing that, um, that's really worth noting, I think, was I was supporting that. That rate of extra pull started to become difficult to support. Um, we had a look at the support they were getting, and we realised the people applying robust design in the different departments were being really creative about the tools and techniques and how they applied them. And it felt like a, a good thing to do would be to get some embedded 
um, dedicated support within the teams rather than a specialist group outside of the teams. And so we got commitment from our um, functional heads to um, identify something like about 10% of this population of 200 engineers who would normally apply robust design. So that's excluding managers and excluding um, some of the, the development engineers, etc. But something like about 10% of our engineers at about 10 to 30% of their time would be um, accredited as green belts or put onto a, a path to accreditation as green belts which is just a badge to say, I am committed to supporting other people with robust design and you can come to me and ask me about it. And if I get stuck, I'm going to go and ask Andy about it. So, so that's the model we set up. And, and the moment we implemented that, the amount of work they were doing suddenly doubled again. So, so I'm working full time, but this, this extra 20 people are all working 10% of their time. And it, it doubled the amount of support we're getting. And I think it changed, although we can't have a measure of it, it changed the sort of quality and nature of that support because these guys in the teams getting support are now getting support from this guy that they know really well sitting beside them. And they're not getting support from some um, boffin expert sitting in an ivory tower in the corner of the building. And I think that's really important. Okay. So the other one is, um, I'm sorry, this is a bit dry and wordy. Um, but we've, we've, when we train people in robust design and there's a separate whole week long training course in systems engineering and you count all the tools and techniques that are talked about there's over 70 of them and you can imagine your engineers when they, um, they go back to their desk and they're, they're told by the chief designer as they are now you shall go and think about the appropriate tools and techniques in your task that they can get overwhelmed you know they'll get option paralysis to use an 80s phrase and um, there's, at the other end of the spectrum, there's a risk that they'll, they'll get over-compliant and go and start applying everything. And, they'll, you know, and over-application is a really bad risk because wasting time on, on non-value-added tools and techniques really goes down badly with the, the budget holders. So we've got a design process now that demands only appropriate value-adding, useful um, systems engineering, robust design techniques are applied. But those applied, um, those appropriate techniques have to be applied on every single engineering task that we do. So we don't have any excuse, but we don't have special projects. We just don't do that because if you make robust design a special projects thing in the way that um, black belts and green belts tend to do projects in the normal sense in uh, Six Sigma, then you t take robust design and you make it something special and it really isn't something special. It's just the way we should work. So we, we refuse to make projects of robust design we just say, in your task, which has a set of requirements, which tools and techniques are really going to add insight and value to that task, and you'll go and do those, and you'll go and talk to a robust design mentor, one of our 20 mentors about it. And, and I think that approach, that selective tool application, has really added credibility with our leadership so that they've continued to support robust design as, as a philosophy in terms of designing our products going forward. I just thought I'd show you a couple of examples because that was all a bit philosophical and dry. So, so here's an example. Unfortunately, Steve's gone home, but the guy who did this actually ended up moving companies to Jaguar Land Rover. So I've told him to get in touch with him. He's a really good guy. This, was a, this happens to be a pipe cover that's on, that goes around the outside of one of our engines in service. And they found that this, this is a little bit of um, sheet metal, sheet metal steel, that this was cracking around that keyhole in service. And uh, I can't go into detail too much, but the cracking was a potentially hazardous failure mode, that, you know, hazardous to the, the aircraft and the pilot. Although it doesn't appear to be, it really was. And so um, our customer was, was uh, jumping up and down. They weren't very happy at all. And, um, <laughs> and we thought, well, how do we fix this? Because we'd already had a go at fixing it. And, uh, and what we'd done was, well, let's make that... Well, okay, so stresses around holes are dependent on the size of the hole, so let's make the hole a little bit bigger, bigger radius, lower KT, you know, should be better. We did that, we sent it out, it cracked again, so the uh, customer was even more cross. And um, as you might imagine, I would have been. And so, so we, we took it into the world of robust design and thought, how do we do this properly? But we started with a qualitative, a qualitative assessment of what it did, a functional analysis of what the different elements of that thing did. And that led us to thinking, actually, this, this non-continuous hoop material there can go because this little ramp here deflects the air 
around the outside. That hoop material was just protecting a seal under there from an airflow around it. And when we thought about it functionally, we could delete it, which left us these two fingers here, which we were hoping would work. Otherwise, it's two fingers up to us. And um, so we deleted that. That hoop material was, was a, a mass on the end of a, a weight, so it was exciting a frequency. And, um, and in those two little bits of metal, we took some, some of the middle out because they were masses too, and that took the weight down in those. And when we analysed that against a couple of modal frequency measures, and then this is a difficult thing because it's excited by broadband frequencies, we found this is all the top, the, so we put all the range of tolerances on it, and we found we got this big mess of results, you know. So if we made any of these within the tolerance band, it would come out there. And then I said, well, how does that compare to the original one? He hadn't done this one, so I got him to stick that one in and run that one around. And you could see there's a gap, there's daylight between the two. And that was really good news. Because actually we knew that only some of these ones were failing. So at some proportion, they're not working. But we knew that these ones were nowhere near even this edge of this one. And this was one of the few times we've been to the uh, Joint Chiefs of Air um, for the European Air Forces, presented them a, a modification proposal, and they've just said, OK, next. That, that's a really positive response from those guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other thing I just wanted to say, that there's a really heavy focus, and you've seen it today, a, a robust design on manufacturing, on tolerance build-ups, on uh, clearances and fits, and, and so on and so forth. But robust design is about designing anything robust. In other words, creating a, a product, which could be a spec or a service or a document or a bit, against a specification. Um, and that, that means it's equally applicable to service. And just coming back to the fact that half of our revenue comes from service in Rolls-Royce. We support engines that are out there for years in service. We've been playing with uh, another area in the, the region of robust design. This has been culturally interesting because our uh, commercial people aren't naturally uh, mathematical thinkers. They stare at us and drool a bit and get cross when we start talking to them about statistics. But um, they've got a, um, a, a simulation model. Basically, it's a discrete event simulator which samples from reliability data of the whole fleet in service. So they can run the whole fleet in service and forecast that 25 years and predict what our costs are going to be depending on what the customer is going to do flying. And then, then we said to them, well, what if, you, um, what if when you repair stuff, this secondary part repair means when you repair stuff and, and replace a bit that was definitely broken, you don't replace all the other bits that look a bit worn and, and shoddy. You know, you just stick them back in and let them fly again. What if you do a bit of that? And we, did, we played out some scenarios and an optimizer improved those scenarios depending on the, the reliability. And we found that, well, hang on, we've reduced our total maintenance cost year on year by an amount that you will see in the first few years because actually the variation in that maintenance cost is also significantly reduced. But the risk that hangs with that is the quality of the discrete event optimizer, um, op the discrete event simulator, and that there's so many assumptions in that simulation model that our current state of play is we're going through a big validation on this model because if it's right, we can save a huge amount of money. So just as a prompt to think about robust design, don't let your minds be constrained by geometry and tolerances. Robust design is anything that you design. So I was just going to, um, I guess I'm just about the right time, isn't it? I was just going to summarize those previous slides in terms of what, what are the key elements of um, successful enablers for robust design. Really, you, you can kick it off, and you'll have to kick it off without commitment from the leadership. So you'll have to start building this up and start winding it up like a rusty old mechanism, and eventually it will become self-sustaining, and that's what we found. Um, but you need to eventually have good commitment from your leadership, otherwise it won't sustain. You need to train people. You know, you can only do so much by word of mouth. You need to have a demand from your um, technical authorities that, that don't allow stuff through if it's not got appropriate robust design. You need support and coaching from people familiar, continuously familiar with the methods and techniques. And you need some level of process that drives that and reminds our, your technical leads of that demand, you know, so that you're making sure you're doing it. When you get that, you start getting what I've called ubiquitous application of selected techniques, which is, a, is our way of, 
applying robust design to everything, but not all of robust design to everything. Just the value adding robust design to everything. And if you do that well, you start getting happy customers. And happy customers are very influential on your leadership. And so you start going around <laughs> a cycle. And, and really, that's what I would recommend um, to anyone who's trying to implement robust design in the workplace. Just try and build it in that kind of pattern. And I think we're nearly there in Bristol. There's lots of places we're not there yet. But, and uh, there's lots of techniques and methods coming out that we need to stay on top of. But I think culturally, the, the real acid test for me is I used to know what all the, the different DOEs and Pew matrices and QFDs they were doing on site were. I went through an engine review recently, and every team stood up and said, I'm doing, I'm doing a DOE to explore the design space, and I didn't know about any of it. So it's just, it's just expanded beyond my knowledge and control, which I think means I'm redundant, which is great, because I've made a job. But you know, that, that was really always my job, and I think it's always the job of anyone in improvements to, to, to get to the point of self-sustaining improvement. And that's it for me. Is there any questions? It's really the, the, the clarity and of the um, response that we give to them. Uh, a, a different example, um, we had a, a cracking problem on, on one of our engine oil tanks recently. And the, the customer was threatening to ground the aircraft if we didn't resolve it quick. And if, if they had to ground the aircraft, they would have gone and fixed it themselves. Um, and so, which we were nervous about, as you can imagine. And so, again, we were... We had a bit of courage. We went away and um, created a, uh, an FE model, and we ran through a, a DOE within some manufacturing constraints. I did some really good DFM and DFA on that work. And, and we came out with, um, with both qualitative and quantitative evidence from DFMEA qualitatively and DFM, and qual quantitatively um, from a, a DOE in a design space, a bit like the, the pipe cover example. And the evidence was so what I'd call slam dunk, it was just definitely going to be okay, you know, that the customer looked at it and they were just totally convinced. So happy customers is not, it could be translated as not angry customers, <laughs> but you know what I mean? But that's, from our point of view, that's happy. But one of the things you get from systems engineering, systems thinking, robust design, is a very clear exposition of how you've got to where you've got and what the answer is and why it's good. And, and that's what makes your customers pleased. Maintenance costs. Was yeah. That all included? Because obviously, if you replace a component that could have run a few years more, yeah. then you would save initially and then you would have to, to pay the extra parts later on. Yeah, so that was, in, that was this one, wasn't nice. it? Nice. Yes. And so, this, this discrete event simulator, it um, samples um, from, from the whole suite of components in the engine for a whole fleet of engines. So, it's quite a big um, simulating model. But when it takes a part out, it resets the life of that part to new, and it counts the cost of replacing that part or repairing that part. So yeah, it, it does allow for the fact that what, when you run it through the optimizer, some parts it says, you should leave those in. And some parts it says, you should always replace those. So generally, the cheaper stuff, it says, just replace it, because you're getting all that extra life for almost free compared to everything else. You end up with a burrito front, and you, you dance up and down it. One more question. Um, uh, Mark, um, you mentioned that you have a lot of uh, uh, pull from the leadership. Yes. How do you communicate to have a metric or some KPI who is like communicating how robust uh, sub assembly or design is? Uh, how do you communicate? Well, the, policy the, the, the best. Um, the, the biggest win we got was when we got to the point of persuading our head of component engineering that robust design was just the way we work and we didn't need any KPIs to measure. We just made, wanted to make a decision that this was gonna, how we're gonna work. And actually measuring robust design is really awkward 
because what you really want to measure is the, the added value to the product in service. But you don't get that data until some way down the line in service. So it's a bit of a, it's one of those things that if you can get to the point of, of um, just a buy-in in principle from your leadership because you, they can see and feel the customer being happy about what you're doing and you're pleasing the customer and you're bringing value, if not in pounds in terms of um, interaction and positive response from the customer, that's my personal recommendation on the way to go. You can have a KPI on robustness, but it's difficult and it's a burden that you want to avoid if you can put that effort instead into making your parts robust. Well, that's amazing okay. the costume for my project then. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs>